All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to present you today my job market paper, which looks at what is the impact of a high skill migration shock on the labor market outcomes of competing uh, natives. So this question has been uh, quite present in the public debate and in recent years, uh, several Western countries have adopted different forms of selective immigration policies. Uh, for instance, in Canada and Australia, they have put uh, in place a visa point system. In the US, we have the H-1B visa, which tries to encourage diversity of origins. Um, and there is also the, the green card lottery. And in France and the UK, there is a, a list of shortage occupation where I'm, immigration is encouraged. And in this particular paper, I'm going to look at the French uh, context. And furthermore, uh, besides this, uh, these policies that have already been put in place, there are discussions ongoing about whether extending this doctrine further. For instance, in the UK, uh, there have been discussion about putting into place uh, a skill-based immigration system plan. While in recent developments uh, after the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen that the US has frozen the H-1B visa system, which is the main uh, way for, for um, US employers to go and, and hire high-skilled foreigners. And this has been claimed um, to be a measure to protect American jobs. Uh, so there are a lot of public debate about this, but little evaluation exists to date on whether this type of policy work um, and what are the consequences for incumbent workers. This has been also quite debated uh, in the literature and the canonical model is considered to be the one that was put forward by a paper by Borjas in 2003 with the title, the labor demand curve is downward sloping. Uh, and the main idea there is that if you take a very simple model of labor market equilibrium where you have a supply and demand, uh, an immigration shock is a supply shock. And so mechanically we expect uh, that after this event we'll have uh, wages of similar workers that, that decrease as a response. However, uh, empirical findings that have followed this canonical model fail to find large negative wage effects, which has given rise to, to a sort of a puzzle. Uh, and so several papers have tried to analyze why uh, we have this discrepancy between what the canonical model predicts and what we find uh, uh, in empirics. And one of the reasons that was put forward is the fact that um, in most cases we try to uh, define these competing markets into uh, education cells. So for instance, if there is a migration shock that is primarily composed of high school graduates, then we're gonna look at the effect for natives that have a high school degree. But these cells might be actually too broad and, and the effect might be diluted. And that's why um, the empirical finding failed to find uh, an important effect. Another result is that migrants tend to suffer from skill down downgrading when they arrive, which means that they tend to work in occupations that, are, that require lower level of education with respect to uh, the one that they have. And so they do not directly compare with natives that have similar level of education, but rather uh, some natives that are at lower levels. Uh, and finally, some papers have shown that natives sometimes tend to switch to better occupations when they are faced with additional competition, which, which may actually uh, improve their, their situation. So the main point, if we want to summarize these empirical findings, is that the group of workers that face the increase in competition is often very hard to, to isolate, uh, and such that the wage effects are diluted. This is in part explained by the fact that most of these papers look at uh, large migration flows that affect different parts of the host labor market, and so it's very difficult uh, to capture the pure competition effect. So what I'm going to do with this paper is to uh, take a setting where the immigration shock is targeted to a narrow list of occupations. And in this case, it's, it's very straightforward to identify which one are the affected workers. Uh, so let me be a bit more clear about what I do. Uh, the setting that I'm going to look at is a French reform that I had uh, for, um, uh, for consequence to ease uh, the hire of immigrant employees within a specific list of technical occupations. I'm going to use administrative employer employee data, which gives me information on hiring flows, employment stocks and wages. Uh, I will note the exact occupation such that I can identify which occupations were part of this, um, this reform. And also importantly, in this data, I can distinguish between broad nationality groups, which allows me to look at the impact of the reform on natives and migrants uh, separately, and then compare the two effects, uh, which is going to be important for the interpretation of my results. Uh, 
my uh, strategy for the main analysis is going to be a difference in difference, which compares the job that enter into the list of the reform which, uh, with a list of similar jobs uh, that have uh, much more limited access to foreign labor. And finally, in a second step, where I try to tease out um, the mechanism behind my main result, I will put forward a production function framework where I will try to recover the elasticity of substitution between migrants and natives. And this is just to give you a preview of my finding. On the employment side, I find that the reform uh, increased migrant hires by about 50%, uh, while native hires in the same jobs are unaffected. So as a result, we have growth in employment stock of about 1.2%. These results on the employment are very much in line uh, with the canonical model, as I will show you uh, briefly in, in, in a further slide. Uh, what is more surprising actually is what I find on, on the side of wages. So I find that migrant wages decrease on average by 3.3% after the reform, while native average wages are unaffected. Uh, and this is surprising given that I'm looking at workers within the same occupations, and so we would expect the effect on wages to be symmetric across uh, migrants and natives. And if I distinguish, so I take the subsample of wages for the employees that just got hired by a new employer, which is what I expect to, to react the most, I find that the negative effect is visible both among migrants and natives, but that the effect is twice larger for migrants. So once again, this goes against a little bit what we would expect uh, from the canonical model. And so I try to explore different channels that can explain this differential wage effect. And in particular, I look at three possibilities. The first one is that migrants and natives might be imperfect substitutes in production, even when they are employed uh, in the exact same occupation. And I do find evidence supporting this channel. Uh, secondly, I look whether there is um, a role also played by the differential bargaining power that natives and migrants have. And again, it seems that this, uh, this channel is also playing a role in my results. While the last one is the native flight effect, meaning that I look whether natives uh, that are faced with this addition in competition tend to switch to other occupations as a response. Uh, and in this case, I do not find evidence uh, supporting this channel. So in terms of the contributions to the literature, I'll be uh, a bit brief. But I relate to three uh, different strands. The first one, is, I relate to the growing literature that looks at the effect uh, of high skill immigration. Uh, most of them have looked at the US context with the H1B visa, but there are a few uh, other examples, such as this, pa this paper by Barely et al., which looks at the context of Switzerland uh, following the relaxation of the, the border controls with the rest of Europe. And all of these papers tend to find mild effects on native wages. And I confirm uh, these same results, but in a context where, where the shock is much more targeted. So where we would expect actually to find a, a greater, greater competition. Secondly, I do uh, relate to, to the literature using natural experiments in migration and to the papers that try to tease out the mechanism behind the mild wage effects. Uh, they tend to exploit variation across space. For instance, the natural experiments, we have a few examples uh, where they use the, the random allocation of refugees across space, or they use uh, 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 relaxation of border controls, and, and they look at the heterogeneity of the effect uh, according to where the region, whether it's close or, or not to the border. Uh, and they tend to find that there is imperfect substitution between migrants and natives. So in my case, I will exploit variation across occupation instead of space. Uh, and I do find support for this imperfect substitution channel, but I also unveil uh, an additional mechanism, which is the one of the bargaining power. And finally, uh, in my approach, trying to estimate the elasticity of substitution that is derived from a uh, production function framework, I will follow uh, others that have done this uh, before. But while they tend to measure this parameter within cells of age and education, I will try to do that uh, within firms and occupations. So this allows me to take into account uh, the richness of the data and try to look really at the level of the firms, which is uh, the, the relevant uh, production uh, unit. Uh, and I will also take advantage of this reform to, to have a random variation in, uh, in, the run, in the relative supply of migrants with respect to natives. So if there are no questions uh, from the introduction, I will move uh, to give you a little bit more details about this reform. I will explain the methodology, present uh, the main reduced form results, and if I have time, I will go into details about my exploration of the channels. Uh, 
So this is just to give you a little bit of context. It's a diagram that explains the procedure that the French employer has to go through uh, when he wants to hire a, a non-European worker. Don't focus too much on understanding it. My main point is actually that it's quite hard to understand, not just for you, but also for employers themselves. Uh, and that this procedure is quite long um, and, and can be a discouragement for many employers uh, to, to try to go through the process. So the official processing time for the entire procedure is set to two months, but we have a, a suggestive evidence from different reports that it can take much longer in practice. And this is relevant for, for non-resident French, uh, for, for non-European workers that are non-resident, but also for the ones that are resident but do not have a work permit. So students, for instance, when, when they're done with their education and if they wanna stay working in France, they will also go uh, through this process. So in red, I've circled uh, the two conditions that are eased by the reform. The first one is that the employer has to go uh, and prove to the employment office uh, that he has been searching extensively for a native candidate. So he has to give the priority uh, to native candidates uh, for, for this job. And only after getting the authorization from the employment office, he can look for, for a candidate, for a foreign worker candidate. Uh, and once this, uh, he has found a suitable, uh, a suitable uh, candidate for this job, uh, he will have to go uh, through a series of checks uh, one of which is that the occupation for which uh, the employer is trying to hire the foreign worker is in a situation of labor market tightness, uh, such that, uh, again, is a confirmation that it's difficult uh, to find a native uh, person that is qualified for the job. And in addition, there are a whole series of, of other verifications such that uh, the, the diploma and experience of the foreign candidate is in line with what is required for this occupation, and also that the wage that is offered uh, to the worker is in line with the branch agreements, etc. So just to summarize, this reform abolishes these two specific requirements, the proof of extensive search for resident candidate and the certification of high level of tightness from the employment office. Uh, so it, it reduces considerably the amount of risk and, and uncertainty uh, around the process. It was introduced in 2008 and the same list is unchanged up to today. There was just a minor modification in 2011 where the list was shortened by half, uh, but this was actually invalidated in 2012. So we went back to the original list that is still in place today. And it concerned 30 occupations, all of which are characterized by high level of tightness. Uh, and then in a second step, so these 30 occupations are defined at the whole national level, and then different subsamples uh, were chosen across regions. What is going to be important for my identification strategy is the fact that this was part of a larger reform that established a broader list of 150 occupations, which include the same 30, but adds 120 additional occupations that get open to EU citizens under transitory regimes. So this was the case in 2008, it was the case for Bulgaria and Romania, which just joined the EU in 2007, but they didn't gain immediate access to the European labor market. So they still had to go through the same process that I described, described here before. And thanks to this reform, in these 150 occupations, they get uh, the, same, um, uh, require, the, the same requirements are eased. Uh, and they both lists are defined based on the same criteria, which is going to be um, interesting for, for the identification. Uh, to give you a bit more details about how these two lists were defined, they were um, the definition was based on these uh, tightness indicators, which are collected by the French Employment Office. And there are a series of criteria, the main one being this tightness index. So for each occupation in each region, um, the Employment Office computes the number of job vacancies or job offers that are available uh, within a given occupation, and it compares it compares it to the number of job seekers that are qualified for this job. So you have this ratio of job offers over uh, job seekers that gives you uh, the overall level of tightness. But then they also took into consideration uh, other criteria such as the volume and evolution of job offers and job seekers, the turnover rate of job seekers, and also to get a little bit of a sense of the quality, they also looked at the share of long-term contracts within the job offers. Uh, so I've, I have access to all of these data which were used to define the reform. And ideally, what I would have liked to have um, in the first place is to have a clear distribution where at the top you have 30 occupations that are in the first list, followed by the other 120 occupations, and then followed by all the others. Uh, 
which would have allowed me to, to do an RDD strategy. Unfortunately, in a sense, there is no clear threshold that defines the inclusion to one list or the other. And this is because, yes, these criteria were used uh, to define the list, but then in addition to that, there was a lot of negotiation with the, with the local partners, such as the um, trade unions, but also the employer associations, etc. So in the end, there is a little bit of arbitrariness uh, that, uh, that defines whether an, an occupation got included or not in the list. Uh, so this is going to be an advantage for, for my difference in different strategy. Just to give you a few examples of which type of occupations uh, are we talking about. Uh, they are mostly middle to high skilled occupations and most of them concern some technical skills. So if you see um, the professional category, the big majority concern technicians and foremen, which are people that have uh, beyond the high school diploma, they have some type of uh, technical specialization. We have a few uh, very high skill occupation, the, one of the main one is computer scientists, and then also a few uh, skilled blue collar occupations. The most concerned skills are the elect electricity and electronics, mechanics and metal processing, construction and, and computer science. Okay, so just as a, as a first evidence that something has changed in the labor market, I look at flows uh, at the moment of the reform. So on the left, you have uh, flows of economic visas delivered every year in France, while on the right, you have uh, the flows of family reunion visas, which are not concerned by, by my reform. Uh, importantly, this, uh, these two figures are not in scale in a sense that family reunion visas every year uh, are much larger than, than the visas for economic purposes. We're talking about 80,000 new visas per year. But as you can see, there is no discontinuity around the time of the reform, not much happens there. While if we focus on the economic visas, which are the ones that are targeted by the reform, uh, there is a clear discontinuity and this flows almost doubles between 2007 and 2008, going from about 20, uh, 12,000 people coming in in a year to, to more than 20,000. So this is a first just very broad macro level uh, suggestion that employers did take advantage of this reform to hire more foreign workers. Moving to, to the methodology. This is just to give you a very simple conceptual framework, uh, nothing new there. It is a basic model of labor supply and demand. The only, let's say, uh, particularity there is that we're talking about tight market and the way uh, I'd like you to think about that is in a situation where the labor demand crosses labor supply uh, in, in a portion where it is almost perfectly inelastic. And what this means is that if you have a labor demand shock uh, that increases the demand of workers, uh, you would have a reaction that is mostly concentrated in wages uh, and there is very, very little variation on employment, which is explained by the fact that most of the people that are qualified for these jobs are already employed. So here I'm talking about occupation specific labor markets and not uh, the broad labor market in a sense. So what I expect from the reform is actually that it would increase uh, the, supply, the labor supply elasticity at the top and so the, the basic mechanical uh, first order effect is going to be that the overall employment of equilibrium increases and that the wage of equilibrium decreases. Now, if we wanna uh, disentangle what happens from the side of migrants and natives, from the employment side, we expect that most of the increase will be driven by, by additional employment of migrants, uh, given that most of the natives were already employment, employed before. Uh, and there was excess demand from the firm side. And if we think about wages, under this hypothesis that within the same occupations, migrants and natives are homogeneous inputs, then we would expect to find the exact same result on, on the wages of migrants and natives, in a sense that they should decrease uh, by the exact same amount. And these are the basic uh, model predictions that I will use uh, to interpret my, my reduced form results. In terms of data, I have administrative employer employee data. So one of these sources gives me information on flows. And uh, importantly, I have the nationality and uh, the specific occupations. And this uh, flow data will include all the plants uh, in the French private sector that have more than 50 employees and a sample of smaller plants. Uh, the second data is going to be the 112 sample of payroll tax data. And this, and this, this um, data gives me employment stocks and wages uh, of all the employees by nationality group and occupation. 
I have uh, plants bigger than 20 employees and I have one twelfth of the total labor force. So it's going to be a random self a sample of one twelfth of the total labor force. Uh, and finally, importantly for, for the analysis of the native flight, so my last uh, channel, uh, this data also include an individual panel dimension in a sense that I do not only follow firms over time, but I can also follow workers. And finally, I have access to this French employment data which gives me the tightness indicators. And as I showed you before, the reform took into consideration uh, several indicators. And so I combined them into um, an index that combines all this information into one single variable. And I compute it, of course, over the period that precedes uh, the reform. So my identification, as you probably have understood, I have uh, treated occupations. So it's going to be the occupations that are in the list of 30 that are open to all uh, non-European workers. While in the control group, I will include the occupations that are in the EU extended list, uh, but not in the, in the uh, one that concern all the extra Europeans. Given that the EU extended list, as I told you, is quite uh, larger, it has 120 uh, different categories in it. Uh, some of them have tightness that are below the mean uh, that is computed over all the occupations. So since I want them to be comparable, in their evolution across time, I will exclude from this list the ones that have a tightness below the mean. But then in one of the robustness tests, I also checked that uh, results are robust to keep the entire control group list. So my main assumptions with this, uh, uh, with this approach is that these two occupations group are, are comparable in a sense that they would have evolved uh, similar, similarly if the, the reform did not take place. And so in order to, to have a sense of this, I will, of course, check the pre-trends. Uh, I also do some balancing tests based on pre-reform characteristics, and I will include the tightness as a control in my main analysis. I also assume that there is an absence of strategic substitution. And what do I mean by that? Is that you could have employers that would tweak the job description at the margin in order to make it into the first list after the reform. Uh, and I want to, to avoid that because you would bias uh, my results. Uh, so the solution I found ag against this threat is that I will exclude from the controls the ones that are really too similar to the treated, in a sense that it would be very easy for employers to just change the job description at the margin. And so the way I define this is that I take uh, the four digit classification and I exclude the controls that have the first three digits uh, that are the same to one of the occupation in the treated list. And the, this uh, define very similar types of uh, types of jobs. Uh, and then another thing that I do is that I look at the uh, at the raw data and how this uh, flows of hiring of migrant workers evolved through time. And, and what I want is that there is no change in the control group. So if I have an increase in the treated that goes uh, at the same time with a decrease in the control, this would be a signal uh, that, that there was some substitution going on. So I make sure that this is not the case. And finally, given that Bulgarians and Romanians are treated in both lists, I will test that there is no asymmetric effect on EU flows, uh, which actually I, I can do in, in the flow data because I, have, I can distinguish between extra Europeans and European workers. So here you have a, a description of my sample. Uh, in the flow data, I have about 300,000 controls and 350,000 treated, uh, while in the payroll tax data, is a little bit less, so about 300,000 both control and treated uh, observations. And importantly here, uh, my unit on, of analysis is going to be the interaction between a specific occupation and an establishment, such that within the same establishment, I can in this case have both treated and control occupations. And there you have the number of occupations that I have in each group. Uh, in the treated, they are 37 and not 30 because the classification used in the administrative data is not exactly the same. So when I tra translate the 30, I get 37 uh, in the second classification. So this is uh, my model. Once uh, this identification is clear, this is pretty straightforward because it's a very standard difference in difference models where my outcome is going to be either hiring, uh, employment stock or wages, always in this cell of occupation cross plan. I have my treated indicator, treatment indicator that is defined at the occupation level and the interaction between this indicator and the post-reform period is going to be uh, the estimated impact, impact of the reform. Importantly, I add uh, some controls for pre-reform tightness and pre-reform plant size. Uh, and I also take advantage of the richness of the data 
uh, to add several levels of fixed effect. So we'll have year occupation sector and region fixed effect. And in some cases, I add also plant fixed effects. And I check that my results are robust to inclusions of different levels of fixed effect. And finally, my standard errors are clustered at the occupation cross region level. Uh, and for the hiring flow data, I will use uh, non-linear models, given that I have a large number of zeros, while for the stock and wages, um, I'm going to use linear models, or no less, basically. All right, so before uh, showing you my main results, this is just um, an indication of the first stage. So in red, you have uh, the average share of migrants within new hires, within control occupations, and this is expressed in terms of growth rate with respect to 2005. While in blue, you have the same thing uh, for treated occupations. And what comes up as, as clear there is that not much happens to control, while the share of migrants within new hires increase uh, substantially within treated occupations after the reform. So this is completely unconditional, but gives us a first indication that, that there is this positive uh, increase in the share of migrants hired uh, within these treated occupations. All right, so moving to, to the main results, and I'm going to show you all of them in terms of um, event study graphs. So all of this, you, you have to interpret it as coefficients of uh, my, my treatment indicator interacted with the dummies. But then at the bottom of each slide, you're going to have my estimated effect for the three years following uh, the reform. So on the left hand side, you have the share of migrants within new hires, which is the same that I showed you before in, in the unconditional evidence. And there is indeed an increase following the reform of about 16% uh, of, uh, of this variable, while there were no significant pre-trends prior to the reform. On the right-hand side, you see the same thing for the log of the employment stock. And you see that the employment increases significantly after the reform by about 1.2%. So this is in line with, with my model prediction that says that there should be an increase in employment stock overall, which should be driven primarily by migrants. So if I go and look at other employment outcomes, I can compute the probability of having a net positive entry of migrants, meaning that you, in one year you have more hiring than exits within these occupations. Uh, and this increases substantially after the reform, while uh, the trend seems to be flat for the probability of net entry of natives. And finally, I can also look at the overall number of migrant hires. And again, uh, this increases by about 50% after the reform while the trend appeared to be uh, fairly flat and not significant uh, for native hires. So this is what I have on the employment side. Again, it seems to confirm what we expect from the model. Uh, what is more surprising is what happens on, on the wage side. And remember here, I would rather expect that wages would decrease by, by the similar amount between migrants and natives. And this is really uh, not what I find, as you can see. On the left hand side, you have the effect on average migrant wages, which decreases substantially and by an amount of 3.3% for the three years following the reform. While there is only a minor negative effect in 2009 for native wages, but if you take the first three years, uh, it's not significant on average. And then finally, as I said, I can uh, isolate the effect on hiring wages so of employees that just got hired by new employers. Uh, and here there is a negative significant effect both on natives and migrants, uh, but the latter is twice as large uh, for migrants than for natives. So the, the next step of my paper is going to try to analyze what is the mechanism that can explain uh, such difference. So um, given that I have 10 minutes, I, I will skip uh, this slide, I have a, a bunch of robustness tests for my reduced form results. If you're interested, uh, you can find the link uh, to my paper uh, to have a look more in details. But let me just give you some details about, about my explorations of, of the channels. So the, in order, one, one of the reasons that can explain the fact that the effect is heterogeneous on migrants and natives is that migrants and natives might be uh, imperfect substitutes in production. And so the way that the literature has tried to explore this is by using a nested CES framework. So I will apply um, the, same, the same framework to this paper. So uh, the first level of the nested CES is going to be uh, occupation. So basically to produce an output to IT, uh, firms combine different occupations together. And these occupations are combined according to the elasticity of substitutions between them. 
And then in the second level of nesting, you have within each occupation, you can hire migrants and natives. Uh, and they can be combined again, according to the elasticity of substitution uh, between them. So the sigma E is going to be the parameter that I will try to estimate um, in this part. So the identification allows me to derive a very simple relationship between the ratio of wages between migrants and natives and the ratio of supply. So the relative supply affects the relative wages according to this parameter of elasticity of substitution. And if we make the assumption that within uh, the same occupation, migrants and natives are perfect substitutes in a sense that they could use, they can be used in the exact same way uh, for production, then the relative supply should have zero effect on the negative wage. So I will try to estimate that. Uh, and I will just have a regression with the log of the relative wage on the left hand side and the log of the relative supply on the right hand side and a bunch of fixed effects. Uh, and finally, thanks to my reform, I also have this exogenous instrument that will affect uh, the relative supply, since I've shown you uh, that this reform affected the entry of migrants but did not affect the entry of natives. So in the first stage, I have my main difference in difference that I showed you before. This is going to explain uh, the change in the relative supply, and then the predicted value of the relative supply is going to be introduced in this uh, second stage where I look at the effect on the relative wages. And this alpha one is going to um, uh, recover the elasticity of substitution. So the inverse of the alpha one is going to give me the elasticity of substitution between migrants and natives. Uh, so this is the table of what I find. Uh, you can just focus on column two, which is the one that uses this uh, instrumental variable approach. And in bold, I've uh, calculated the degree of substitution that is estimated, which is just the inverse of my parameter. And what is surprising here is that yes, 7.7 .7 is bigger than one, meaning that natives and migrants tend to be substitutes in production. But it's quite surprising in this context where I'm really looking within a specific occupation uh, that there seems to be imperfect substitute. And this can explain uh, why the effect on, on wages is heterogeneous uh, between these two groups. And then um, the, the last step is going to be to check whether this uh, parameter is purely technological. And we know from this paper uh, by Dasman, Frattini and Preston is that we can only interpret this as purely driven by technology, only if there is no other mechanism uh, that can drive this differential wage effect. So uh, for, uh, first of all, if we think that this is uh, explained by technology, uh, we can make the hypothesis that the more an occupation is diverse in terms of the task that it involves, um, the, the lower the substitution parameter, in a sense that greater task diversity within an occupation will allow for greater specialization of migrants and natives in different tasks. And this will lower the substitution parameter. But then another likely mechanism in my case is going to be differences in bargaining power. And this is explained by the fact that when migrants come in with these economic visas, they are tied to a given employer. And if they want to change uh, employer, they will have to convince someone else to go through the whole process again. So this means that they have very limited outside options, while natives, they are free to move across employers, and this gives them greater bargaining power. So in order to test whether this is playing a role in explaining uh, the fact that the wages do not react the same way, I will look at meaningful heterogeneities. So once, one thing that I do is that I compute a measure of monopsony power by, see, by looking at how much a given occupation is concentrated among a few employers. And the hypothesis there is that the greater the monopsony power, the lower the outside options of natives, which makes them closer to migrants, um, because both of them will have a lower outside option. And in this case, I would expect the substitution parameter to be higher. And according to similar reasoning, if I compute the out mobility rate of an occupation, the, the easier it is uh, for, for natives to switch to other occupations, the greater outside options they have. Uh, so the more they can leverage this greater bargaining power, and I would have a lower substitution parameter. And finally, a third uh, possibility is that there are compositions effect that are driven by migrants flying to different occupations following uh, this increase in competition, which I would I will also test. The final one, the skill downgrading, has been put forward by the literature, uh, but in my context, is very unlikely, given that here we have uh, fairly high skill occupations and migrants that apply to them have to 
uh, possess the right qualifications to fill them. So uh, this is not likely to be a channel in my context. Uh, so just this is just a summary of, of the same uh, the same estimation of the elasticity of substitution. Column one is going to be the same um, as before, so my main results. And then I look at the same, I do compute the same regressions, but in different subsamples. So in column two, you have subsamples where there is higher monopsony power, meaning that natives have uh, little bargaining power and they're more similar to migrants. And what I find there is that the elasticity of substitution is indeed higher, meaning that uh, the, the, there might be a bargaining power story playing out in, in my case. Uh, and similarly, in this low occupational mobility case, uh, once again, I find an elasticity of substitution that is slightly higher, which goes again in the direction that uh, when bargaining power of natives is also limited, these two inputs seems to be more substitutable. Uh, on the opposite, where I look at higher task diversity, so where there is more scope for differential specialization, uh, there, the elast estimated elasticity of substitution is lower. Uh, so this is mostly in line with the technological story. So of course, this is suggestive uh, evidence. Uh, the standard errors are fairly big, so if they're not, th these coefficients are not statistically different from each other. But at least in terms of the direction of the reaction, it seems that both the bargaining power and the technological story uh, seems to play a role in explaining this differential effect on wages between natives and migrants. And finally, this is uh, my last slide. I use this individual panel component that I have in the data. And here, let's just look at panel A. I will compare native individuals that were employed in treated versus control occupations in 2007. And here, instead of following, occup uh, following occupations, I follow workers. So I look at whether workers that were employed in these occupations and face an increase in competition, whether they have a higher probability of changing firm or changing occupation. Uh, following uh, the reform. And as you can see, the, the coefficients are not significant. So this seems to say that uh, there are no composition uh, effect or native flight effect following the reform. And finally, if I look at sal salary on the worker side, so I follow them even if they change the occupation and if they disappear from the sample, I give them a salary of zero. Uh, and this is, again, a supportive evidence that there is not much uh, of a salary cost for these uh, native individuals. While um, I'm not showing you uh, for the sake of time, but if I do the same thing for, for migrants, I confirm the fact that there is a negative uh, pressure on migrant salaries. So to conclude, uh, with this study, I show that uh, this reform increased lastingly migrants' hires in these targeted jobs without harming native employment. So as a result, we have uh, the level of tightness that is reduced. Uh, the negative pressure on wages seems to be twice stronger on migrants than on natives, and this seems to be explained both by imperfect degree of substitution in production uh, due to tax differential tax specialization, but also to differences in bargaining power. So in terms of answers to broader questions, it seems that high skill immigration is an effective tool to counter these domestic skill shortages, at least in the short run, which is what I can address in this paper. And we have limited effects on the native population where the population that seems to suffer the most are migrants uh, from the earlier waves. And finally, the question of whether there are broader benefits in terms of firm performance, so for instance, whether firms that were looking for computer scientists and could not find them Finally, get the, they can hire a foreign computer scientist, whether they gain from that. Uh, I actually have a second paper uh, where I look at the firm, firm outcome and I try to tease out whether uh, their growth was, uh, was undermined by, by the skill shortages. So that's all uh, I wanted to show you. I'm really looking forward to hear your questions. Um, and if you want to write me further comments, uh, please do, and I'll be very happy to read them. Sarah, thank you. Thank you for this uh, insightful talk. Uh, I will give the floor to, uh, to Narcis first. He has uh, one or two questions. So Narcis, you can unmute yourself. That should work out, Narcis. You can, you can go ahead. Narcis? Not working. 
Okay, let's let's try with, with Salvatore and then we will come back to, to Nancy's questions. Salvatore, you should which which one do you do I have right now? Guys? <laughs> yeah, okay. perfect. Can you hear me, Luca? Yeah, yeah perfect. No, yeah. I can I can hear you. Go ahead, okay, please. Okay, thank you. So, Sarah, thanks for this great job. I enjoy the presentation. I have a small question. Uh, you definitely conclude that the, the skill that downgrading cannot explain. Uh, I mean, the channel of skill downgrading cannot be active in, in your model. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering whether you have maybe control, first of all, where the migrants got the skill, I mean, where the migrant got the skill? Did the migrants in, in, uh, enter the country with the level of skill for which he's hired by the company? Mm -hmm. if... Yeah, so, so the reason why I'm saying that in my case, there is leader's call for skill downgrading is that uh, I'm, I'm looking at occupations, so I know which natives are, are doing these occupations and uh, migrants need to be qualified for these jobs in order to apply it for them. So if what you mean is that uh, depending on where they come from, they could have uh, better or worse levels of education and so that the same diploma might not mean the same thing depending on in which country they got it. Uh, that's, a, that's a great point actually. And unfortunately, I mean, I would love to have the information about where these migrants come from to have a bit uh, more, more information about their, their country of origin. Uh, and unfortunately, with this administrative data, you can only distinguish between um, Europeans, non-Europeans, and French. Uh, but I don't have additional information on their country of origin, if that addresses your question. OK, the, uh, the second concern is, is there any possibility for you, for instance, to follow a cohort, uh, the same cohort of workers, to see whether the competition effect might be active over the time? Um, yeah, so that's really what I'm doing in the, in the last uh, slide. Of course, maybe I went a little bit fast. But so I have this uh, panel, uh, panel data on, on workers, so I can follow workers through time. In my main uh, specification, I'm following occupations. But here, what I test, and I'm showing you the results for natives, is that I'm, com I'm comparing natives that had different occupations in 2007, but I then follow them through time. So even if they change job over, over the following years, I follow them. And that's uh, this results on their effect on salary is really their overall results. So com combining the ones that remain in these occupations, but also the ones that switch, and also the ones that actually leave the labor force. So, so I, I keep them in and I give them a, a salary of zero for, for this case. OK, perfect. Thanks. All right, Sarah, I take the lead again, and I have two questions from Salvatore, but he has no microphone, so I will read them, and, and then you can, you can answer. Mm -hmm. So the first one is um, that um, might the new hires be legalized workers? So that's uh, the, the first question. And the second question is about the structural model. Um, so you, you assume a, a constant elasticity of substitution among hundreds of occupations within the firms, and uh, Salvatore is willing to, to know how do you handle this, basically this, um, yeah, this constant elasticity of substitution. So that's the, the two questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the questions on the legalization is one that comes back uh, quite a lot. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not sure I can say that much uh, because uh, even if uh, these workers were not legal uh, beforehand and then they get legalized, they would appear uh, as new visas delivered, since they would uh, appear as if they were not in the country before. Something I can say is that given that here we're looking at relatively highly skilled occupations, these are not jobs where we usually we have a, a very high concentration of uh, illegal migrants. So the only ones that are a little bit of concerns are, are the ones that concern the, the construction sector. Um, and so in, in some in some tests, I try to exclude the construction sector and this, the, main uh, direction of, of the coefficient seems to hold. But that's pretty much all I can say uh, regarding the, uh, the legalization. And in terms of the CES, uh, I'm using this framework and I'm actually following others that I've done that before uh, 
uh, is because it's the simplest uh, production function framework where you can have uh, this variation in the elasticity of substitution uh, between migrants and natives. So if you use a Cobb Douglas, of course, uh, you don't have any variation in this elasticity. You assume that this is one. Well, if you use a CS, you can actually estimate it. And so if you find, uh, you can also find an elasticity that is infinity, which will go back uh, to, to the perfect uh, substitution parameter. Um, so so I, I'm doing this because it's the simple, the simplest parametrization that allows me to compute uh, th this value that is what I'm interested in. Thanks, Sarah. I think I think it it uh, answers the yeah. So Salvatore said thanks. So that sh should be fine. So it seems that we oh okay. Joel Joel is raising the hand. Joel, I will allow you to talk. So normally you should be able to speak. Right Can you now. hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. Thanks for the nice presentation. So um, I was just wondering the negative effect on the wages that you find. How much could this be due to um, a composition effect in terms of the high risk. So what I mean by that is how much can you account for the fact that new migrants being hired are likely to be um, unex well, are by definition actually uh, unexperienced in on the French labor market and therefore might just have a lower wage than uh, the already the, the migrant which is who is already present in the um, in the labor market. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, when you when you do these graphs where you show the, the negative effect on the wages, can you account for this somehow? Because I, I, my guess was that you were looking at the firm occupation level, if I'm not wrong. Indeed. Yes. So um, yeah, let me go back to that. Yes. So indeed, you, you, are, you are right in a sense that you have new migrants coming in and they're, they're driving part of these results. Uh, and as you say, it might be a somewhat a, a composition effect if they are less experienced. Uh, something I do um, in order to account for that is that is here I show you the, the hiring wages. So these are people that just got hired. So they could yeah. be just hired from another firms, but they could, the ones in, in, in my treated group are going to be just hired in France. Uh, I also do uh, the opposite. So I only keep the workers that were already employed by the firm in T minus one. And I do find uh, a negative effect. So this average effect is both um, explained by, by the new hires, but also by workers that were already present in the firm, which already shows that this negative effect is also there uh, for, for workers that were present uh, before the reform. So and everyone then I, before the reform in that one. So you yeah. just keep the, okay, I see. And then when I, I, when I do the panel here, I show you the, the native results, but I did the same thing for migrants. Here mm -hmm. you have them there. And so the effect on salary is negative and it becomes significant when you take people that were in the country already in 2005. So it seems that uh, even if you account for, for occupation movement, firm movements, even the ones that were there before have a negative, um, a negative effect. But you're, I agree with you in a sense that the overall average wage is driven by both, um, and there could be a little bit of this uh, composition effect. But then the negative effect, if I may uh, follow up question, my, my intuition would have been that in France, it's very unlikely that a worker's wage will be revised downwards. So this yeah. negative effect would mainly be, an, I mean, if you were to interpret this negative effect, it means that in the treated group, wages of migrants that were already there before the reform will grow will grow so it's a question of growth wage growth rather yeah. than level at the yeah. at the lower rate than control group sectors is yeah. this also something that you i mean is it something that you also check for the pre uh, treatment trends mm -hmm. yeah so the, the effect on the when i look i follow occupations and the ones that on the incumbent are indeed only driven by slower growth for sure mm -hmm. because in, in mm -hmm. france it's even illegal to to nominally lower the, the level of wage in this case where i follow uh, individuals through employment spells they can be driven also by switching of occupation employer or even by going out of the labor force given that in this case uh, i keep i keep them in so i give them a value of zero uh, in, you mean whether i check whether wages were growing before the reform whether the, the wage growth dynamics are comparable across occupations. Yeah. Because I was just wondering, 
the the split between control and treatment group is likely not random, right? There must be a reason why um, one occupation makes it into the top 30 list and the other doesn't. And I was just trying to understand whether like some difference we can't control for would could explain this um, the different mm -hmm. effect that you that you obtain basically. Yeah, so this is the balancing test. So I'm comparing uh, average mm -hmm. uh, characteristic between oh, yeah, okay. and control prior. So there are a bit of a difference in level in the number of migrant hires and the mm -hmm. shares. But when I look at the growth, uh, they seem to be comparable. And there is indeed this little difference in the pre-reform level of tightness with treated occupations being slightly more tight. And that's why I include so, this control in my different group. OK, thanks. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? That's the last last moment to raise. Oh, nice. One more. So Ismail uh, will ask a question. Hi, Sara. Thank you. Thank you very much for your your, your presentation. Uh, so I have a two questions actually. Uh, one question is about kind of external validity of your results for the EU migrants, uh, because I understood you are checking the effect of, you know, like allowing more, well, easing the entrance of, of non-EU migrants. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, and also related, is regarding the size. So by by how much the, the new entries that came after the reform, so by how, so how much this visa account for the total entries of of migrants in these occupations mm -hmm. yeah so the, the question on the external validity is a great one and i would have liked to to test whether this elasticity substitution is maybe higher uh, for migrant work for eu workers than for non-eu in this case and my entire variation is driven by non-eu and actually in the in the wage and employment data i cannot distinguish between uh, EU and non-EU. I have to bunch all the non-French together. Uh, so unfortunately, I, I cannot say very much about that. There could be a, a suspicion that EU workers might be more substitutable uh, to French also because they have, um, potentially they have the same bargaining power in a sense that they are free to move across occupations. They are not, they do not have to uh, have to ask for a visa so they can switch. Uh, the only difference might be technological in a sense that they might not have the same level of language um, ability, for instance. Uh, but of course, it's not really something I can test here. And about the visas as well, I don't, I cannot distinguish uh, by which type of visas foreigners came in in my administrative data. So this picture that I showed you before made me think that all of the differential effect that I measure is driven by this given that I do not have a discontinuity in the other type of visa. Uh, but, but once again, in, my, in the main data that I use, um, I unfortunately cannot distinguish between yeah, the so, economic visa and the other. Yeah, so I mean, for, like, I completely believe that you are accounting for the right effect. Like the, you know, this, this figure is quite, uh, uh, like I believe it 100%, but my question is like, how important are those flows accounting for the total inflows of migrants into this occupation because um, unfortunately these legal pathways actually are not moving much people Indeed. so mm -hmm. so um, my concern is like how big is this like how representative yeah. are these these immigrants for the total you know immigrants coming yeah so if we think about this 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 change is about uh, more than 10,000 uh, new people so this accounts for a bit less I think I should have it somewhere. It should be a bit less than 10% of the total employment stock in these occupations. So it is uh, relatively big in a sense that this is a change of 10%. Uh, and not uh, all of it is, is driven by the reform in a sense that the increase in employment that they find uh, in, in the ident with my main strategy is 1.2%. Uh, and then if you want to relate this to the broad labor market, these occupations that, that I'm looking at, uh, the, the 30 occupations of the list uh, are about 12% of the French private sector. So they are a significant part, but not the majority for sure. So I think to, to give you a broader answer, uh, the, these migrants 
do change a little bit the, the composition in these occupations uh, because they account for, for 5 to 10 percent of them. But, but in terms of absolute flows and their impact on the broader French labor market, then, uh, then it's very small. So I do not expect any general equilibrium type of effects, uh, given that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So I think I think we are done for for today, uh, and I will um, just uh, let. Elsa concludes the, the meeting and I thank you all for, for this nice presentation, nice seminar. Okay, so thanks a lot, Sarah, for your presentation. It was a pleasure. And next week, uh, we will have Adam Levy from Louvain who will present a paper, a paper written with Ricardo Turati called The Impact of Immigration on Workers' Protections. So have a nice day and see you next week, I hope. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Yeah.